Oh, hi. I'm at the moment on the way to the basement of our legacy operation building. Because here is our connection point to the rest of the world, to the network. And um, here you have all of the switches where all of the messages, all of the data run over to connect the internet and also the rest of the networks here at the observatory to our systems. What you also see here is the, uh, the transfer from the classic network with one gigabit, which is historically grown. You see the, the different cables here, to the new setup uh, for a 10 gigabit network, which is also in some cases a change from copper to fiber, like here. So we have a lot of uh, new fiber lines, fiber connections between the different buildings. And this is the hardware, so the lowest level connection point um, of the ports. So you have to know about gigabit connection and uh, uh, conversion. You have to think about multi-mode, mono-mode, about different connectors, things like that. So, but I don't know if you will get in contact to these hardware systems. But as all of the messages run over these systems, you see the blinking lights, I think you will get in contact to send and receive your own, let's say, control packages or data packages between different servers, between different data centers. And therefore, we will have to talk about communication. And this is our final lesson. How can we connect our computers to the rest of the world to share our data? So welcome to the lesson. Welcome again to the final lesson of this semester. So we had together 12 lessons plus one of my colleague where we touched a lot of different disciplines starting from the binary world, coming to computer languages. We also learned a lot about um, the use of data, so databases, also algorithms. Um, and about data formats and today finally we want to talk about to connect our computer or our data to the world use it every day because you have your mobile phone you request data you request web pages so we created web pages but now we want to bring these web pages to a mechanism so that you can share this data and therefore we have to talk about these things here so about communication and especially about the different communication models so this is our first our first starting point so how does it work that you can send um, individual message like uh, messenger message to another mobile phone so what is necessary as a communication stack to send these matches out of your mobile phone then we'll talk about the different topologies um, in earlier books you learn about ring topology and um, star topology things like that we won't take care of this anymore because nowadays everything is based on Ethernet or the most things are based on Ethernet and therefore we will talk about the Ethernet topology 
And then there's the question if you are able to send out the information. How finds this information the destination? So how can I get this information to arrive on the partner phone or on the partner computer? Therefore, we have to talk about addressing and there we want to talk about the different mechanisms, the classic one, the IP version 4 and the new one, not so new anymore, but still very new, IP version 6. Okay, and then a very, very, very important subject. If you're connected with the rest of the world, don't trust because there is always a person who wants to get your data and therefore we have to think about security to protect your network, your computer, but also your data from an unallowed access by an attacker or any other person. So these are the subjects which we want to look into. Let's start with the idea of communication. So if you watch this, this is the general principle. You have an application, so this is one computer, you have an application, the application is your program. So you wrote a program or you have an email program, you have an app on your mobile phone, doesn't matter, you have an application. And you want to send a message from this application to this application. So a messenger service on this mobile phone to a messenger service on this mobile phone. So this is what you call user-to-user -user communication. This is what you see. If you use your mobile phone and you send in a message, then you see this interface. And then it runs through some stack, some work packages, and it arrives in something like a communication subsystem. You can compare it again to the situation like in a processor. So where you have also the operating system things and then the low level physical things. So we are here in these low level physical things. So this is where the real communication happens so that it is converted from this message to a really routable package. So this is the communication between computers. So the computer to computer communication. And then it's sent to the real network to the hardware, to the data communication network, and it can be just a, a, a wire, or it can be a complex Ethernet or whatever network, or mobile uh, network, or Wi-Fi. It's a physical layer, and this is then the computer to network communication here, this error. So you have the connection point to the network, and then it runs on this data communication network. What you see is this, and what is necessary is this. So you have the whole run through this representation. What you usually find if you talk about networks is a model which is never uh, really realized. It was never realized in the complete setup, but it is so nice to explain the things. And it is the seven layer model or the OZ ESO model. Um, because it was defined by this international standards organization, ISO, and um, it's called the OZ model. What's the specific thing? You have seven layers doing different things. So from the hardware connection, the physical layer, to the application layer. So you see again this jump from the user communication to the computer to computer communication, or to the network communication, so where you have the data network. And you have different specific layer combinations. So this part is network dependent, and this is more or less application dependent. If you send in the pure data, so the information which you really want to send from here to here, then at each layer it's a little bit packed. So each layer adds a little bit of additional information. For example, um, to organize um, error situations or things like that, to find lost packages like here somewhere. So each 
of this layer adds a little bit of information, of meta information, of additional headers and trailers to, to solve individual tasks. So if you if you watch to this, this is more or less the network environment. And then this gray part here is this OC environment, which is called Open Systems Interconnection Model. So this is this OC part. And the whole part here, all of this is the real communication environment. As I said, this model was never really used. But it is so nice to explain all of the individual small pieces which you need to send an information from here to here. And therefore, we will have a look into these different uh, pieces. Again, with this layered model, with these seven layers, so you have here the physical layer up to the application layer, and we will see the differences of all of these tasks. So if I jump to here, you will see uh, the different tasks. So you have the physical connection to the network which terminates the, the, the endpoint. And then you have a mechanical and el electrical interface. So you need this definition. It must be clearly uh, standardized because uh, you need the exact voltages, you need the exact timing, you need all of these uh, special hardware specifics. The next one is the link layer. So this was the physical layer and the next one in this OZ model is the link layer. The link layer does the framing so that you have packages in principle um, and it does the basic error control. Then you have the network layer. The network layer does the addressing and the routing. So what you need is an address. Just get the idea of a normal package, you go to the postal office, you write the address of the destination on it, it must be a special, uh, must have a special structure, must be on a special place, and then you have the city, the zip code, the, uh, the street, the street number or house number, and then the name or sub, uh, sub address information, things like that. So you have a special structure and then you give it to the postal office. And the postal office then starts with sending. So it sends to a central uh, postal uh, um, uh, uh, packaging um, service and so on. So that it goes step by step from you to the destination. And this is what happens here. So le let's call the network um, uh, or this network layer the, the postal layer. <laughs> so um, additional to that you need this transport layer. This transport layer makes the end-to-end -end message transfer. So it, it really establishes the connection so that for example if you need uh, like with a, with a normal communication you want to say hello and your partner says hello and then you say I want this the person say here is this or don't have this so that you have a communication something like a handshake and therefore this connection management is done here so it's on top of this network transfer on the sending of single package packages without knowledge about what is the uh, real if, if it is in the right order or something like that the, this ordering is done here it's also an, another error control and is also responsible for fragmentation for example if you have different networks you have different sizes of packages nowadays you have large packages if you want to send um, for example video streams or something like that it would be better to have large packages um, and therefore the, this fragmentation so to, to come from large to small packages um, is also done here so this is the part up to the transportation layer and then the rest of this OZ model starts. So uh, it's the network independent part which, which happens here. So this is more or less network dependent and this is then network independent. And then you have the session layer, the presentation layer and the application layer. So the session layer is the dialogue and synchronization control for the application. So it's more or less application oriented. Uh, there is also a transfer syntax negotiation and uh, a data representation. So, for example, how you represent the data, big and little and things like that you have here. And then also how you represent the, the message in this, in this. So, for example, the high level things like ASCII or uh, other rich text formats or, or other whatever. So, um, and then you have this syntax independent message part. So here you're, you're, uh, you have this interchange to this where you have a special syntax. 
So what, what, what does it mean? You have the file transfer, you have a document sending, you have message interchange. So this is really the application, but it's what the application needs for sending the information. The real application is this end-to-end -end user uh, application process. So you have these layers, you have this real application. Here in this case, the application is more or less the user, and then it starts running through this process. So in each package a little bit to this to this uh, message. The problem is that this lasts quite long. Therefore, it was never really realized. Even if all of these things are necessary to send messages, also on your mobile phone nowadays, it's the same stuff, but it is a little bit too bulky and therefore um, it changed to another principle, which was called the TCP IP stack. So it's a stack like here. So you have a lot of layers and they're doing the same things, but it's called the TCP IP stack. And you see, it's not completely, uh, you cannot, have here a, a fixed border so it's a little bit from here it's down here and, and so on in, in in this stack but the, the big principle is, is the same so the, the big difference is that you don't have seven layers you just have four layers which combine uh, layers from here and you have here the network interface which is the in principle the physical and the link layer you have the internet work layer and internet working layer which is the network layer in principle. So uh, addressing things like this, the routing. And you have this transport layer, which is uh, also the transport layer from here. And you have this application layer. The application layer is the real application. So the real application, uh, which is necessary for uh, application libraries, which are necessary to send information. So this is much better. And most of these things are also uh, realized in hardware. <coughs> because as faster as you run through this stack, as faster you uh, arrive on this uh, physical um, network, and as faster you get your data out of your hardware. And if this physical layer is also, because all of the computers which, for example, send on data to the next step, like routers or uh, switches or things like that, that have to deal with this stuff here. So they have to work also with additional addressing and routing mechanisms. And therefore, you need, again, things um, in, in, in the different communication part to transfer data. And therefore, as faster the stack, as faster also your network can uh, be realized. So um, to show you a few samples um, of, let's say, protocols, because at each layer you define a standardized behavior, so a standardized uh, workflow, and this workflow is defined by a protocol. Um, protocol you can think about like uh, you meet your uh, friend and you have a special ritual at the beginning. You have a, a special protocol what you do. Um, also, if you go into a restaurant, you have a special protocol what you have to do. You just not enter and sit down, for example, you wait uh, at, until you're seated or something like that. So you have a special behavior uh, list and this is also for the protocol. So there is a special communication um, definition which must be followed. So and at each layer you have different protocols. Here, for example, for the physical network uh, part for the telecommunication standards, you have this IEEE standard. Uh, which is the, the, the standard for network switching or package switching. Then you have the IP internet protocol. This IP protocol is mainly uh, used for um, routing, for addressing. So therefore, if you think about IP version 4, IP version 6, so we are here. And then you have TCP and UDP. So we have two different possibilities. You have the transmission control protocol and the user data can protocol. What are the differences? Both are protocols on a layer where you have additional information like, um, uh, for example, uh, the sequence of packages, but it's only available in one special protocol, in the TCP protocol, for example. Because TCP makes a connection which has a session. So, for example, you open your... Um, you're meeting with your friend and you say hello and your friend says hi and then you say um, 
do we go to the restaurant and if friend says yeah let's do that so for this whole thing it's always good if you're connected so let, let, let's compare it to a face-to-face -face connection okay so it's always nice if you watch into the faces it's not so nice if you uh, do something different then you say something again okay so um, this face-to-face -face communication in principle is this TCP communication it opens a session you say hello and then you stay connected so each message you send has a special sequence so it has a special flow and therefore it's 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 fixed to to a special let's say uh, workflow or data flow UDP here is different UDP is something like you send out the message and everybody who wants to get it requests it and also you have no no real sequence so you you, you crowd is there somebody who has dish number 10 or something like that okay so and and then uh, this is the broadcast message this broadcast message for example is sent to anybody uh, and 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 somebody comes and says oh I have this okay this is a broadcast message or with UDP it's the same you make a connection to a special end device for example you have a streaming service you want to send out video streams so you send out these video streams and it doesn't matter um, you want to get the most speed so it's not necessary that always a request comes back and say okay can you send me please the next one can you please offer the next dish <laughs> something like that so it's you just send out the data and all the time you lose a data set so for example you can have on a higher level some numbers so in in the differences for example that for UDP you have no sequence numbers so you have to do it here on a higher level so each time the application detects that the package is missing it requests on a, on a separate line please send the package again while here in TCP is automatically uh, checked and is automatically resent so you have re really here the, you have this this fixed connection and here is just sending out streaming out crying out all of this stuff okay there are advantages and, and disadvantages of course this is the usual thing what what is used for all of the communications but is slow in in case of real time things and this is used for uh, real time applications but this is the layer uh, for the transport and then you have these application parts and these application parts are the file transfers or the secure shell so that you can log in from the remote to your computer telnet for example can com uh, command uh, things similar to ssh but ssh is a secure method so you have uh, keys and uh, ciphering mechanisms also uh, domain name services so that for example you have aliases for your computer um, if you think about web pages you don't enter the pure addresses you enter something like a name and this name is an alias for a pure web uh, address and this web address is a combination of, of bits so you don't think in bits you think in real human readable names and therefore this DNS converts these aliases into real addresses for example or also mail sending mail receiving uh, classic protocols are this SMTP uh, or POP3 nowadays you have different protocols to make it more secure <coughs> so therefore these are the layers and these are some samples of the protocols so again I already explained this the message the pure information is sent to the stack and at each level of the stack the message is extended with an with a header and with a trailer or with just a header so it is packed again in a package you can think about like you want to send something with a postal service and and then you pack it into the first package and then that it gets not broken it is packed again in a package and then it is brought into a truck so in in in, in the trailer of a truck so it's again packed and then uh so on so that you always have additional packages uh, like a container or something like that where again a lot of packages are packed inside things like that so that you need always additional information like address information or you don't need special information from the higher level layers and for each layer for each of these 
steps, the previous data gram or data set which is created is used like a message of the next layer. So if you start here, you have the message and then the message is packed with a layer uh, with a header and a trailer. And this header message and trailer part is then used as a new message in the next layer. So you extend your, um, your usual message with a lot of additional information. And this is that it looks like this. You have a datagram unit or protocol datagram unit, which looks like this. So what, what you really want to send is this information. This is the information which the user really wants to send over the, over the network. So the pure data and the rest is of course the largest block, but the rest is also added so that you have information about the way to the destination. For example, what you have is the source port so that you can come back uh, to the sender. You have the destination port. You have, for example, a sequence number. You have an acknowledge number so that you, you can arrange the packages again, like here in the TCP IP protocol, that you can arrange the packages in the right order, things like that. And then you have additional flags, checksums and uh, window sizes, which are organizes how many packages and how the packages are sent um, and things like that. So you add a lot of additional things like here in this TCP IP uh, stack, uh, which gives you the addressing sequence numbers, for example, uh, also a sequence number of the last acknowledgement message so that you can trust in this sequence, in this protocol flow, that you always uh, accept and make it okay uh, of the last sequence which you receive, things like that. And then you have also the so-called sliding window effect so that you can adapt your sending to the complete communication um, so that you can adapt the number of packages sent out and, and the flow over the network so that it arranges. If you, if you do, for example, a benchmark of the internet uh, sending, you always see that it's an adaption and you will get in mean a special transfer rate, but it is always adapted. And if you have an interrupt, for example, that the message got lost, then it starts again from the new and it adapts automatically again. So well, what you should remember is that you have the pure data and you add additional information to it. Okay, um, what you should also know is that the access point which you use in your program is the transport layer. So the TCP and UDP protocol is your abstraction layer where you can send in information and where you can make a connection between two application, two individual applications you use. And FTP, SSH, all of these are just, of course, standardized, but just other applications using this TCP UDP uh, access point. And you can write your own program, your own communication, if you use these access points. And such an access point is called socket and it requires a unique address and a unique port, um, for example, like, like a door number. So you enter a large uh, skyscraper and it has a special address and then you have the floor and then you have a special door number, for example, so that you, you really can identify the individual door in your computer. So a, a computer has a special address and it has a lot of doors which you can open to receive information. So, and then uh, for, uh, let's say TCP, so this session-based mechanism, then you have a special, um, a special workflow or flow through the messages, what you do. So you always split it up between a server and a client. So what are the differences? A server serves and the client requests. So in, in cases of a web browser, so you have the server, it's the central utility, like a search engine, a server with the program of a search engine, and the server just waits until somebody requests something. And the requester is your mobile phone requesting something from the server. So you have this client-server model, which is a very essential um, 
uh, scenery because you always have central computers which wait for requests from distributed computers so and then of course the server must first of all start to uh, create his own socket or its own socket so its own connection point to this stack to this low level TCP IP stack and then it must bind its application to this socket so it must say okay this is now my socket my communication port and then it listens it listen means it waits until the client requests something so it waits and waits and waits until somebody comes and requests something the client does exactly the same here it requests a socket. A socket is nothing more than a number which is, like with files, connected to this door, to this exis, uh, exit and an entry point. It's nothing more than a number. So a uh, address combined with an additional number is the real address. So like, like the address of a house and the door number. And then it binds the application like the server to this communication port. And then there's a difference it's not necessary that it listens it wants to activate the communication and therefore it must connect to the socket and must send the first request so it sends the request flowing over the network and then the server gets this request and accepts the request receives the message so accepting means okay it's for me i take it and then it receives the message so the real content the information the complete unpackaging stuff of these headers is done automatically in this TPI, uh, TCP IP stuff. So only the real pure information arrives in the application layer of the server. It processes the data, so it has to understand, for example, what to do. So uh, please send me the next file. And then it processes this and replies to this message. So it sends a reply message and waits again for the next request. So this reply goes again over the internet or over the network to the s to the requester to the client where it is received so it's the same like here it receives the message and it can now work on it so it can process this reply and it can start again with a new send so it can now send a new message and so on so this is done for example if you open a web page then all of these individual parts, the images, the uh, individual other includes uh, are requested separately so that you get the complete stuff. So this is why sometimes if you have a slow internet connection, you see different pieces of the, uh, of the web page at different times. Okay, and then after loading all of this stuff, everything is visible. So these are a lot of these requests of the TCP IP uh, suite. And finally, if the client does not want to request anything anymore then it has to close the socket so it says okay like with the file connect over the same can be done by the server though is if the server do does this uh, socket close then nobody else can request anything anymore because then it's the communication the listening port is closed but this is this handshake mechanism so it requests these uh, things it's always the same process so that there is always one active partner and one passive partner so the passive partner just reacts on requests and the active partner here the client really requests these things so this is what i wanted to tell you about these communication models the communication models, the OZ ISO standard or ISO OZ model, um, and also the TCP IP uh, stack or suite, where nowadays this TCP IP suite is, is used. So we will finish this communication models. Let's think about the Ethernet communication. So this is nowadays um, what is used everywhere. So first topology which you can think about is the point-to-point -point connection. You have a cable, you plug one cable here and one cable here, and then you have a direct interconnection between two computers. As long as this and these hardware connections are the same, so that you have a standardized, uh, let's say, electrical level, it works. So you have 
the user to user communication, the computer to computer communication, and the computer to network communication, where you have a point to point wire link. Okay? So it's, it's nothing more like this. It's not so helpful. It's just a one to one connection. You usually use this for uh, like USB or something like that. It's not real network, but you can think it's a device which is directly connected to your computer. So which uses your computer, for example, to record data. Much better is and was if you can separate these two devices so that this cable can get longer. So longer means you have to cut this and you have to think about how to make a cable as long as it so or as long that you can connect two different computers on different edges on the world. And how can you do this? You have to use different standards and different uh, mechanisms where you have repeaters and things like that. So, therefore, um, it was used the normal, let's say, telecommunication lines, and they used so called modems, modulators, demodulators. So, they converted the pure communication to a new mechanism where you had a modem link via public switch telephone connections, so this PSTN. And you needed a conversion from this network part to the worldwide uh, connection. So, and therefore, it's not possible to extend the distances, but it's nothing more than a one-to-one -one connection. So it's nothing more than a one-to-one -one connection, um, just with a larger distribution. So, much better or much more efficient is if you can connect different devices to different other devices. And therefore, this was or this is the starting point of the Ethernet or of the Internet in principle. Because you have one line, this line is a hardware device called Switch, where you plug in a lot of your devices or your computers and it connects everybody to everybody by trying, for example, to make a real um, individual connection. So you can have a hub or a switch which just connects physically all devices with all devices. And this is called the Ethernet. And the problem is now that how do you organize that all of these computers can send information and can receive information to all of the other computers while not interrupting or disturbing the others. And therefore, you need the so-called CSMA-CD model. And this is what I want to explain now. So what you have is, you have the network. The network in computer science is always painted like a cloud. So you have this, this cloud here. And you have a lot of people um, who want to communicate you see a lot of people and they doing a listening so they listen if the carrier so this means the physical layer here of this uh, network is free so that nobody else talks on this layer and there is no communication active on this medium so think about that this cloud here this this cloud here is the table uh, where you do your breakfast with your family so you have a lot of people sitting around, your kids, your wife, your grandma, and so on. A lot of people sitting around and they talk to each other. How does it work? It's the same scenery. So if everybody talks at the same time, you hear nothing. What you can do is you can directly talk to one person face to face. Um, or you listen to the others so that one speaker is available so that's something like a broadcast to all of the others but you have to have a special discipline so that everybody on this or around this table um, can or has the chance at least to talk or to, to bring to send out his or her individual information and it's the same here so this breakfast table is our network and now everybody is listening. And then the next step is that one has an idea. I want to say something. So in this case, we have two people here, two people having this idea. 
here. Oh, I want to. I want to. I want to talk to somebody. I want to send out my information. I want to tell somebody uh, my message. So what does it do? So all of these people who want to send out information check if the carry is free, and each one can access this medium. So in 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 the breakfast table, it's the air. In uh, the network, it's the physical layer. Can access this freely and can start to transmit the message. So it's like with a breakfast table, two people start talking. And then we have to listen. So therefore you have to listen if, for example, another also started with talking because then the message got interfered and you don't hear anything. So you check if somebody else also started to talking and then you stop your communication because you detected a collision. So what you had here is you had here uh, the situation of a multiple access on a carrier sense. So you, you took care and you listened on the carrier on the in, in the breakfast table on the air. You listened here on the network. It's the, you made a carrier sense. Then you had multiple access. A lot of all of the people around the table are able to talk at the same time. So you have multiple access. But what you do is you detect uh, uh, collisions. And this is this principle of the CSMACD uh, mechanism. So if you detect a collision, you stop talking. So you, you stop the communication. But what's now? So how do you come out of this uh, situation? And the trick is now that you wait, you wait different times. So you wait a little randomized time, as long as the same randomized uh, mechanism does not calculate the same uh, randomized time, you will come to a scenario that one starts earlier than the other. And then you start talking again. <coughs> and this is the, the, the big principle of this communication. But also like with a breakfast table, there are people talking, there are also people talking to each other, maybe also with secret information, but it's not the best situation to give secret information on the breakfast table because there are people sitting around and even if you have the window open, for example, somebody else outside can listen to you. So therefore, you can have somebody like here, a spy or a so-called network sniffer because everything what is physically on this network, on this, um, on this medium, can be listened and heard by anybody, by everybody here in this, in this uh, network. And therefore even you have the situation like with this window, somebody outside can also listen. If there are connection points to other networks, you have the situation that you can uh, really sniffer this information. So everybody in the network can receive every message and can sniffer on its content. And um, you won't believe um, if you don't use uh, trusted and ciphered and, and encrypted mechanisms. So if you just use like these old SMTP pop mechanisms or also FTP, you won't believe that if you sit in a cafe and you open uh, your, your laptop that you really find or still find um, people sending out information without any protection. So it's, it's really a dramatical thing because you don't think about that but there is really the situation that everybody can listen to that so it's not protected so everybody in the same network and the same network is the Wi-Fi so it's wireless so everybody around 300 meters um, is able to listen to your network as long as you don't do a ciphering or a encryption mechanism and therefore, uh, there are also tools um, which, which doing this. These tools are usually used to detect errors in the network, to detect uh, package uh, repeating parts or physical errors. Because then you can record uh, transfers and you can check if there are errors inside. But you can really read the messages with these tools. For example, one is Wireshark uh, in, our, in modern Linux systems. And everything what is sent in the, the network can be read. So if you write your own protocol, for example, 
um, as a, a communication between an end device like a meteorological site and your uh, computer on a socket, on a TCP IP socket. With this uh, sniffering tools, with a sniffer, you can really get the information because then it's not uh, encrypted. So the pure data are not encrypted. So therefore, it's a critical uh, thing to use this uh, ciphering uh, or this sn sniffering tool, sorry, <laughs> to use these sniffers uh, in normal network because uh, data uh, protection things like, uh, like that are e really a huge case. Uh, but in, in most cases, to detect errors in the network, is it's necessary to, to work with such tools. But what you should keep in mind is, everybody can read your data if you don't protect them, okay? So now we have a nice, let's say, local network. So we are somewhere here. So you see, we're somewhere here in this cloud. It's our breakfast table. Um, and now we want to connect to the breakfast table next door of our neighbor. So what do we have to do? We need a connection point. And this is what we had as a modem, so modulator, G modulator. But nowadays you have a switching network so that you can connect to anybody. So it's not only a, a pure connection which you can interrupt, you have directly the connection to everybody in the world. So, and what is, what is now the next step? You have a connection point to the next high level connection uh, situation which is for example an NREN, National Research and Education Network or a telecommunication network. So you have a local area network, your breakfast table, you have another breakfast table in the next door and you connect this with your switching network, with your phone network, with, with the current uh, fiber network connection so that you have possibility to connect individually session based or, or uh, not session based to all of the other uh, communication elements. So what are these connection points? These connection points are called gateways. So they, they are gateways, large doors where you can define special security things. And for example from or the connection of all of these national networks is then the so-called wide area network, WAN. This wide area network is the rural network. So you have a lot of wide area networks connected um, so different country networks and the whole stuff is then a wide area network. So with this, you can now jump from here to here. But how does it work? How does the message from here comes to here? So what, what, have, what must be the, the content of that? So the trick is that you have a lot of interconnection points. So you have a so-called dynamic routing. This dynamic routing is based on routing tables, on information, how to get the data in the shortest way with special algorithms to the next position. Um, it's a realization or a, 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 a sample of the small world phenomenon. Um, you have always person or single elements with a lot of connection points and you have single persons with a few connection points. And as long as you have connect connection to this, let's say super spreader, you, you really have connection to all of the rest. So uh, there's one, one simple nice game called the Kevin Bacon factor because um, some students decided to send packages from East Coast to West Coast or vice versa, I don't remember anymore, in USA. Um, but not with a postal service, they want to send Kevin Bacon, or it was an imaginary idea, to send a package to Kevin Bacon, to the actor, uh, without using normal transfer mechanisms, just with handing over to the next person. And the next person should find the best way uh, into the right direction. So it's a similar what you have here, this algorithm is you search the next possibility. So if you, rem if you know somebody closer to the destination, give it to that. And it comes out that at least in the mean, you will just need seven hops, so seven individual steps to reach any person um, on the world. So it doesn't matter. So in this case, in mean, if you have such a situation, you have a lot of different routes 
So if you send an information from one position to the other, you will find a lot of different routes and all the different packages can run through different routes according to these different algorithms. Um, as long as they arrive in the right sequence and order uh, on the other uh, computer, then it works. And this is this dynamic routing. So for this routing, you also need, of course, addresses. You need the information of where to go to. And you need also an information, what is the next step? So this is um, not a trivial situation, but the, the big principle is quite simple. Always give it to the next higher level, um, maybe knowing more about the final destination part. So, um, if you watch this, you have a lot of gateways, you have a lot of connection points. We already talked about switches, or I also mentioned a bridge or a hub, something like that. So in this scenario of our local, let's, let's say, breakfast tables connected to the uh, next uh, connection point live with NREN, um, how can we arrange or what are the different connection points, these gray boxes here? So these gray boxes describe different, let's say, hardware boxes working on different layers of the regional OSI model or also TCP IP model. Um, the simplest thing is a bridge, a bridge or a hub. You maybe know it from your uh, desk in, in, uh, on, uh, in, in the office or something like that. It's a small piece of hardware you can connect eight or or 12 different computers and they really physically are connected so there is no decision it's just a physical connection a stable standardized physical connection so that every computer is connected to every computer at this connection it's not necessary to really know something about the routing or things like that because it's just a physical connection like what we have seen before uh, in this diagram with this Ethernet the next step is a switch, is an active component. It's again a physical connection, but a switch can decide who is connected with whom. So, what does it mean? A switch can really make something like a one to one connection, but a dynamical one to one connection. So, if one computer starts the communication to another computer, it's an individual communication which is directly connected, and, and then it looks like a really physical connection between two computers. And if the computer starts with communication to another uh, computer, then it's also, again, a physical communication. So what does it mean? A switch must already know a little bit more about um, the different network parts. So it must go into the link layer part. It must know the hardware addresses, so the original addresses of a computer. And then you have a router. A router decides to which network uh, it sends out an individual package. A router has usually uh, one, uh, usually two or more connection points. And here is the decision point to send out to also world area networks or uh, local networks, uh, or at least uh, local national networks, uh, to decide that this IP address does not belong to my uh, network, to my local protected network, it belongs to another one. So that the router can decide to send out uh, things to another, um, to another network which is connected to this router. So therefore it must go to the layer, to the next layer, where not only, let's say, hardware addresses, local hardware addresses are important, but also routing information and IPs, also aliases, things like that, and ports, for example. And then you have the large sequence of firewalls. These firewalls are nothing more than higher level um, decision maker. So they work up to the application layer and they decide if a special application has the allowance to send packages. And a file can even read the content, can decide about the content and can break the content and can interrupt the content. So you need uh, the requirement to go into the real information package, not only into the routing package, also into the information itself. 
and therefore you have different classes of connection points. The highest level is the firewall or also combinations like uh, firewalls and routers and usually what is called a gateway is a combination of a firewall and router or several routers and firewalls so that you have different uh, connection points, different local networks which are connected with the world network and things like that. So these are the different levels from the poor, let's say physical connection of a hub to the real uh, sophisticated filtering mechanism uh, on application layer level in a firewall. So these are the network topologies and we now have to think about how does a router knows when a package arrives where to send this package to. So it, it must be or there must be something what is called addressing. So there must be a unique address, a worldwide unique address but how does this work? So is there a possibility for a unique address? Or if you don't have unique addresses, how can you organize this? For example, if you have these interrupt points, these this connection points of a router or of a firewall, is there a possibility to hide, let's say, local networks with one address and to send this information out so that at least there's just one address visible in the whole world and, and that the router knows where to send the packages to? And this is what we want to discuss here in the addressing segment. Addressing happens in the internet working layer. So this is one address part and another very important address part is in the network interface. So the network interface is more or less a unique stamp, a unique number of a uh, network card um, which is called MAC address, Media Access Control uh, address or Link Layer Hardware address, uh, which is a unique device address, hardware device address, um, so that especially in local networks, the devices are unique. So you have two positions of network addressing. The one is the MAC address, which is in principle the the, the pure hardware address, so uh, a, a pure stamp on the hardware, and an individual uh, adaptable high level address, um, which is IP version 4, IP version 6. So how does it work? Let's start with the IP version 4 format. What we have is a sequence of numbers. Remember the first lesson, bytes, you can represent 256 elements from 0 to 255 with one byte. So the IP4, uh, IP version 4 v4 is exactly a scenario where you have four bytes which represents the address. So the last byte is in principle the local network sequence, so the individual number of a computer and the rest is the worldwide identification and as IP started a um, long time ago there was no uh, uh, imagination about how large networks can become in the future and that this is a tremendous huge impact on working on working life and that a lot of computers will be used in the future and therefore they started with four bytes so the number of addresses or the number of possible representations is not too big. It was enough in the 80s, in the 90s, but already at the end of the 90s of the, foreign, uh, of the previous um, uh, century, it was not enough anymore. So how does it work? You have always eight bits, one byte, which represent, you have uh, in total four bytes and these 32 bits represent your address. So with this, it's a unique identifier for your computer. So separated in network prefix uh, and host identifier, you can also classify your networks. Nowadays it's not used too much anymore, but previously you had different classes, C class network and B class and A class and so on. So you, you take, for example, if I go to here, you take a little bit of this address space for the identification of the network, which means, for example, our network here of the observatory has this worldwide unique address 
and then um, here <laughs> on this part here the rest is the individual identification of local computers so you have a network prefix and you have a host identifier so for example an address looks like this in the decimal representation and uh, the first two uh, 24 bits for example identify the network so sometimes you see this slash 24 this is where you directly use this uh, network prefix so that 24 bits represent the network problem is now that you have more computers than addresses so therefore the gateway or the router must decide um, about uh, for example um, which address you hide and you just share outside one individual address and you make something which is called network address translation so that you have more addresses inside and all of the addresses inside are represented outside with one address so um, let's talk about these problems and disadvantages with this IP version 4 there are two less addresses available for all end devices Internet of Things and things like that but already this was clear in the 90s as already mentioned so there was a request of comments um, about this stuff and um, you have also a missing effect on, on automatic configuration you have to enter it manually um, or you have to use uh, domain name services aliases and, and then you have to use a central uh, name server to automatically have uh, a dynamic address assignment things like that like DHCP you have a reduced efficiency because of checksums in the packages you have missing end-to-end -end principles like the routing fragments uh, or routing fragments the packages in different ways uh, managed in each section uh, so that you have no influence to the different communication paths um, and you have influences into the runtime of the packages you have a missing flexibility for the future internet of the things a lot of devices have now internet connectivity and they need unique addresses and you have also security issues everybody is able to listen to this thing so therefore uh, about uh, or because of this scenario there was a new standard or, or a new definition of a new standard version 6 this IP version 6 defines now a new address style so this new address is in a short form looks like this so um, the problem here is directly and this is why IP version 6 is not used so often uh, until now uh, in local networks because nobody can remember these addresses so you have to work with aliases and things like that or you have to work with this automatic identification mechanisms of IP version 6 but let's let's talk about this so let's start with this reduced information so you see fe80 uh, colon colon and so on so if you remember the binary uh, lesson the lesson about this binary formats it looks directly like an right hexadecimal representation so you have a hexadecimal representation and then let's go rule by rule back to the original bit representation so that you see what this is really or how this can really it really represented with a bit stream address so the first rule says all alphabetic signs are lowercase so all hexadecimal signs are lowercase IP version 6 addresses are eight blocks which are separated with columns so you have here now two columns in, in a sequence and not eight blocks you have one two three four five blocks so there must be something which replaces the rest of the blocks and th this is the next rule two columns combine sequences of zeros it's only allowed to have one combination of these columns so the only one block of, of zeros can be reduced and this must be the largest the first largest one uh, combinations always from the left side so you always start from the left and no combination for a single zero sequence so you don't skip a single zero sequence you just skip blocks of zeros so if you do this you have then this here now you have these eight blocks 
separated with columns. So from this you come to this, which is then FE80 colon zero colon zero colon zero. So these zeros you can pack together and you can uh, uh, replace with this double colon sign. And then let's continue. So single zeros are always also four for uh, element block or for uh, uh, number blocks. So all leading zeros must be left away. This means you always have four um, hexadecimal numbers and leading zeros are usually left away. So the last zero of a zero block is always kept. So if you have four zeros, you always keep one zero. So from the previous address to this, we come now to a block of these bits. And then if you want to have the real binary representation of this uh, number, remember that four bits are one hexadecimal number. So this comes from the number uh, representation system. Go back to the video about that. Um, so what you have here now is you have a hexadecimal representation from zero to F. And if you convert four bits are always one hex, so you have always four, 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 four. So you have uh, 16 bits which represent the first part here. Okay? And then you have the colon, and then you have again 16, and you have the colon, and again 16. So what does it mean if you watch now the different addresses? So the short form. Of an address in IP version 6 looks like this is a hexadecimal uh, representation. In IP version 4, it's a decimal representation. But you have just four byte numbers. So the whole bit, so all addresses which you can represent looks like this here, this red part here. And for the decimal um, IP version 4 mechanism, you have this. So it, you directly see that you can represent much, 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 much more uh, individual addresses. So what does it mean if you calculate, for example, the number of representable uh, individual addresses? You have 32 bits here, the blue one, the IP version uh, 4 mechanism. This means you have 2 to the power of 32 different addresses, which means that you have 4.3 times 10 to the power of 9 addresses. Um, you have to use this network address translation, so this means you cannot give any individual device a unique address, and therefore you have to hide, you have to share addresses, you have to use routers or firewalls as one single address to the rest of the world, and uh, behind you have a lot of other addresses, which you represent then in the router with an uh, address, and a port. So an individual port is then forwarded to an individual computer because not all computers use all of the open ports, so all of the open doors. There are only a few, in a few individual ports used and therefore you can also connect a port with an end door, so with a door at the end device um, on your computer. And therefore you can connect a single address of a router and the port where the port connects to an individual address in the local area network and therefore the router or the firewall has two, two legs, two connection points, one to the uh, external network and one to the local network and then it connects this. So if from the external network uh, there is information coming to a special port is sent to an individual computer with a local individual address. This is called the network address translation. So it translates local network addresses to ports and external IP addresses. This is a problem and therefore we can go to, to this. So if we have, you can count all of these ones in series, you will come to 128 bits. So if you have 128 bits, then you have 2 to the power of 128, which means you have 3.4 3 times 10 to the power of 38 addresses. Um, <laughs> I cannot imagine this this number. So therefore I calculated um, what does it mean. So you have one address for each single device worldwide and this means you have 600 quadrillion addresses per square millimeter on the earth's surface. 
So if you have a millimeter on the Earth's surface, you can have 600 quadrillion addresses. So only in, in this area where you stand now, you have as many addresses as you want. So IP version 6 helps you to solve this problem. But you have to deal with these addresses. And therefore, in local area networks, these addresses are much more common than these addresses. In rural area networks, it's completely changed that. The nice thing is that now also you have different network structures. So you have this hierarchy again of the different networks. So you can split a little bit of the address. So for example, with a slash 32, it's the same like with IP version 4, where you take a little bit for the network identification so you can take a little bit for the network identification of the whole internet a little bit for the provider a and a little bit of the subnet and so on so that you always split a little bit in a hierarchical structure that you have worldwide uh, network organization okay so you already learned a lot about um, networking now on the higher level part. Um, as I said, we don't discuss the low level things um, like which fiber cables or fiber optic signals, which uh, nanometer of laser you need and things like that. So this is a own field which you have to think about. We, we watch or we focus on to the programming level. And we now know how the addressing works. We know that we have to create a socket, what, what we have to uh, use. And the real uh, communication functions really um, uh, are named like this, like uh, socket uh, open and things like that, or bind or listen and things like that. Finally, at the end of this uh, lesson, I want to come to one very specific thing which you have to think about about security because if you're connected to the whole world the whole world can get access to your computer and therefore we have to think about security i just give you the basics of course it's their own field so there are a lot of specialists uh connected to this field of security so i can just give you the, the basics but le let's have a look what, what we can do So what, what does security mean? <coughs> security mean, or what are the security factors? Security mean that you have availability. Um, so it's, it's similar like with the quality factors in software, you have to fulfill special security factors to, to uh, realize a secure network. So availability. Availability is that you protect resources from attacks which block them for authorized users. So uh, the typically is a denial of service attack. So if you have a computer in the network and there are so many um, requests that the server cannot do the job anymore and it breaks down, it crashes. You have it several times. For example, if you have elections or things like that uh, for music uh, uh, competitions or whatever, that the, the servers break down, you have no availability. This is also a security factor. Then you need authentication. The user who wants to access your computer must be authentic. So it must be certain and authentic that the user can identify to access computers or services. If you know, for example, that the user is really the, the user who should have access, then it's also necessary that he or she has only access to the data or to the services um, to which the user is allowed to get access. So you have an authorization and access control mechanism. It's the next security factor. It means an assignment of dedicated rights to users, computers or services, which can be used to grant access to resources like hardware or software or data. Then you need privacy and integrity. What does it mean? the protection from un uh, unauthorized notice or change of data. So it's directly connected to this authorization, authorization but um, you should keep the integrity so that data are really the same data, even if more than one person works on the same computer. And then you need accountability and non-repudiation, uh, uh, which means 
Activities are uniquely accountable to real users so that you always can connect an activity to an activity of user or of a service uh, and these users cannot hide their activities so that everything what really works on the network is really publicly visible and is not hidden behind for example an iframe it's a, it was a very famous uh, error or uh, um, warm or trojan horse um, distributor that the blocks in the early days had no checker if for example html could be used and then it was possible to uh, hide an iframe because in, in html you can hide uh, things and you, they hide an iframe with a uh, javascript loading a special program which loads then special um, destructive software so this is not or should not be allowed so therefore you have to split between different levels of security so the first level is the local security in the local security it's exactly what you do daily with your computer if you open for example windows or linux you have to log in with a user and a password and here i give you one additional tip um, you should not use um, an administrator for the daily work. So do not use administrative users for surfing in the web. Even if the operating system protects you from that and, and uh, or protects you from external access because there are firewalls on your computer and things like that. But if you have an additional user, a normal working user without administrative uh, possibilities, but with the possibility that he or she can acquire administrative possibility. You can install things without changing to the administrator, but an automatic script cannot automatically get access to administrative tools. And therefore you should always have two users on your local system. What's the big issue in local security? You have an uh, authentication mechanism to identify users, user password um, or two-factor or three-factor authentication nowadays so that you have different levels then an authorization mechanism to control the access so you have special rights for example if there are two users um, on one computer uh, if there are two users then they have different folders and the folders have special access rights so that one user cannot spy in the folder of the other user uh, protection mechanism against blocking applications so that one user cannot block the other. A protection mechanism against malicious applications which interface uh, interfere with or spy on other users so that one user cannot listen or ac access data from the other user. And an accounting mechanism to limit resources so that not one user, it's the same like, like here, uh, uh, blocking application so that one user not has the full access and the other has no access almost. So what is usually what you do? You have a user ID and a group ID in Linux, for example. So you have, can combine users. You have super user rights, root rights, uh, or administrative rights. And you have the normal user rights. And you have a password encryption. So you identify the user by an ID, by a name, by a, a group or you uh, and you have an, a special password for that or you have a fingerprint and things like that so <clears throat> we have to think about passwords so security is always connected to passwords and the first simplest mechanism is that you do a simple symmetric block cipher algorithm so ciphering algorithms are very strange so it's it's really difficult to understand all of this so therefore, I just give you the, the basics of that um, so that you see the, the general principle. And for passwords, it's quite simple because you have the password in plain text like this. Um, by the way, it's no password which we use here, so don't try it. Um, so we have a password in plain text which you encrypt with a special mechanism with a, with a symmetric uh, block cipher. And then you get an encrypted version of this password. So the simplest way now is if you enter a password, you run this process and you don't need a way back here or oh, here, no here, <laughs> sorry. So you just have to encrypt 
and then you compare this binary stream with the existing binary stream. You protect this file and then you have everything what you need. So um, you enter a new password, you compare it, and if it is the same, then you have access. So this is the simplest way. There are two mechanisms. Uh, you can do the encryption, but there is also a mechanism to do the decryption. So there are different mechanisms like that. Um, you always have one individual key. So you lock or you unlock with the same key. Um, or you don't need the unlock anymore because you just compare the result of the locking. Um, and um, different types of this or uh, representable uh, things for this block cipher are the data encryption standard or the triple DES. These this, uh, examples are, are uh, algorithms for ciphering uh, in these symmetric block cipher algorithms and uh, or the advanced encryption standard. There are also others. If you're interested in that, look into uh, the individual documents uh, in the internet to uh, get this working. So AES is very famous. Uh, we also used AES sometimes to encrypt uh, passwords in, in software. So this is the simplest way how you can uh, grant access rights to individual users. So how can you get access to external users. So therefore you have to do a little bit more. For example, you have to use access control lists. ACLs make it possible to define any number of additional access rights to file and directories. So you need additional information on access rights. Okay? Then keep the user in his box. What does it mean? For example, with Java you have a a Java engine and it's not possible to jump out of this engine. Uh, therefore Java is much more secure than JavaScript for example. So uh, restrict the activities of a remote user so that he cannot see third-party directories or run programs or change anything on the machine. We use this uh, with a restricted bash for example so that if you log in onto our machines as an external user you have only the local directory and you cannot jump out of this box. You 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 kept in this directory and you have also a control about the programs uh, which the individual user can can use. So therefore, you have um, a, a, a strong mechanism to keep the user locally, and you have no uh, or it has no or the user has no access to other programs and data. Then reduce the access points. This is a quite important thing. Use packet filters. So, for example, you you filter addresses and ports uh, to restrict incoming, outgoing, and forwarding traffic. Which means, um, if you don't use a port, or if you don't need a port, the door to a computer from another uh, way from uh, external uh, internet, then block this. Don't allow to to access this. So, for example. If nobody should use the SSH, the secure shell from external, then you can block this port, which is port 22. So door number 22, which you don't allow that packages go through or go to this port. Okay, so reduce the access points. In principle, you deny everything and you just allow the few things you need. And then a new way of encryption, so additional encryption um, which is a little bit more complex than this uh, single cipher, which we saw before. Um, so encrypt information of incoming and outgoing traffic. So also uh, have an individual signature, things like that, so that you can identify that a user is really a user and that you don't need the knowledge of the original key, so that you have two keys, for example, one key for uh, encryption and one key for uh, decryption, so that you have a public key and a private key or something like that, so that others do not need your own key to access data. So let, let's first of all look into the reduced access points, because what you can do is the following that you have uh, for example, an interface, which is a hardware network card, a hardware ne network address, for example, and Linux is Ethernet 0, which is connected to the network. Computers can have different networks. For
for example here um, I, I show it to you one is the this network and there's a second network called a network uh, port which is not used here so we just have we just focus on one so we don't focus on forwarding from this port to another one so which is maybe or which is uh, used in gateways or routers we just focus on one connection point where we have the connection to our network and then you can have incoming so input and outgoing output messages and what you now can do is you can restrict the ports you have uh, over 60,000 possibilities so over 60,000 or uh, different ports or different doors and only a few are really used and only a few are really used for individual communication so for example if two computers have to communicate to each other it's not necessary that others in the network also see this communication port or this door so therefore you can restrict these access points to individual let's say destination or source addresses external addresses and you can restrict it to individual doors and you can also restrict it that you for example like here you have to make the establishment so you start the communication and everything what comes in is only allowed if you are the person who started the communication so the communication must be already established this is of course just possible with TCP with UDP you have to run in a few tricks so that you have to remember what is open is usually done by firewalls but um, here it's only allowed or it's only in a pure way possible with TCP this is usually done with IP tables uh, they are modern uh, or newer versions of these IP tables but what you usually find on your router at home is exactly the definition of IT IP tables what you do is you define the input and the output or also the forwarding but we focus on input and output you define it on which hardware uh, card you want to do it and then you decide which port which destination and which source port and um, for example uh, the different flags so if it should be established and then you deny everything and just allow the few things which you really need um, if you have a lot of or just a few connection points to connection points so if let's say five computers should connect to five computers on the same way if you do all of these definitions then it really grows so you can have 30,000 rules just uh, by the definition that you have for example five to five computers or or five to 20 computers or one to other computers so it, it, it is really a difficult thing and you should always have a special order to do this but it's possible Usually, uh, for firewalls do it automatically. Your router at home does it also automatically, uh, defined by, for example, uh, your uh, tele telecommunication network service. Um, but you can also do it here locally with these IP tables. And for example, in Opsodu, you have to do this anyway because you have always connection points to other computers. So, um, this was the reduce access points and another thing is we have to think about sophisticated ciphering or encryption mechanisms and this is the asymmetric ciphering algorithm so what what do we do we have the plain text password or whatever and we cipher it we encrypt it with one key so that we have it in the binary version we can send it over the network and for the decryption we need another key so we have a private and a public key so people who want to send us information encrypt the data with a public key and we can open we can unlock the information with our private key we don't have to hand out this private key we just forward the public key and everybody who has the public key can send us information we can uh, encrypt it uh, uh, or decrypt it um, sorry so therefore there are some uh, representations so this RSA uh, was named after or according to the inventors Ron Rivest, uh, the Shamir and Leonard Adelman uh, or Edelman um, also this DSA is one uh, on version of this um, asymmetric ciphering algorithm the digital signature algorithm or L uh, gamma there are also others 
Um, again, if you want to know more about that, watch uh, the individual papers and, and individual uh, definitions and descriptions in the internet. What you should just keep in mind is that you have a public key and a private key, and this is used for SSH, for example, or also for HTTPS. So um, HTTPS and SSH also uses a very special version. It's a combination. It's a, let's say, hybrid mechanism. So it uses just for the exchange of a session-based key, it uses a special um, public and private key version. And then the session is again encrypted with an individual own key, which only exists as long as the session is open. So therefore you have an additional security. And I can show you this, um, or explain you this on the basis of SSH. Uh, it's called hybrid cipher algorithm in the SSH and um, this uh, hy hybrid ciphering algorithm or SSH uses this method. Hybrid ciphers generate a session key which is used to encrypt the complete communication of one session but it's only valid as long as the session is, is uh, active. Only this session key is encrypted with the original primary key algorithm. So with a previous shown algorithm of a public and private key. The rest of the communication is encrypted with a temporary session key, which offers additional security because the next session cannot be encrypted anymore. It's comparable, you know, from the Enigma or Purple in the Second World War, this uh, ciphering or encryption machines where you had individual keys uh, per day or, or per uh, communication. Uh, so that you, it, it, it was quite difficult to identify or to decipher uh, information. The following authentication combinations are uh, possible. For example, you can just use a username and a password or you can use a private key file without any additional security information so that you have either username and password or you have this key file, this private key, which is nothing more than a sequence of uh, bits. You can also use a private key with a special pathphrase, which is nothing more than a password for the private key. Or you can use the private key and a username and a password. Or you can use all of this, the private key, the passphrase, the uh, username and the password, so that you have a very high security situation. And with this, you just encrypt the individual temporary um, encryption key. So therefore you have a, a huge uh, security uh, in SSH. And what you then do is you create different levels of uh, security. We call it enclaves. Um, so you have different um, layers of firewalls. For example, um, you have a very high level sophisticated firewall here at the connection point to the internet which protects the whole observatory here from attacks from outside. So you have a proxy firewall, uh, which is a gateway implementation, uh, so-called multi-homed host, because it has several legs or several connection ports to individual uh, networks, like the demilitarized zones or um, also local networks, things like that. So it's a very complex system based on a root recombination with firewall combination a uh, very modern system and you have then the local area network here and then in the local area network you have an additional zone uh, which is for the machines for the individual uh, devices connections of individual devices for the controlling of radio telescopes or things like that where you have an additional firewall or a router with uh, a special filtering technique so that you have a so-called dual home host so dual home hosts or firewalls with two legs so that you have one leg in the external network in this case the local area network of the observatory and the other in the internal network of the um, of the telescopes so therefore an attacker from external has to go through these firewalls and he has to use special keys also for the access to here and also special keys for the SSH connection so that you have a lot of different uh, mechanisms uh, you have always, always a multi-factor authentication so that you have always a very specific access point um, so that you have to know a lot of things. You have to, have to have the right 
uh, parse so that the security is really high in this case and um, you can use different types of firewalls in these scenarios so usually here you have this higher level gateway scenario so for example what is called a proxy application or gateway firewall uh, in the internal parts it depends on which security you have to realize for example if it is uh, if it is just to uh, if you have just to guarantee that for example uh, no one can control your antenna or access the data uh, then you can work with routers or with uh, IP filter routers um, so because you protect ev everything with this firewall from the external world and you protect just the individual devices uh, from from let's say wrong packages or things like that so it, it depends on its design the network design is a very very complicated and complex um, scenario which you have to fulfill why I want to come back just uh, to one sample again is that with this uh, scenario which you already know you have a network connection point um, this network connection point is our connection point to the computer and if one computer has two or more internet connection points as already explained you can also define rules for the forwarding here so that for example packages come in here go over a forwarding rule to a package going out to the next network so that you have two different networks here and you can decide which packages are allowed to pass this barrier so you can decide incoming and outgoing uh, things for each individual network which means incoming and outgoing to this computer or you can decide the forwarding rule um, so that you can decide which packages are allowed to be sent out so um, I think this is all what I wanted to tell you about um, communication um, and this is also the final lesson of this semester so therefore I want to thank you all for listening it was a great job um, it was nice um, and it was quite interesting in these days of uh, COVID-19 to give this lecture um, and finally I want to show you one special uh, change of my person through this pandemic situation so I took from each video um, or each week of a video I took one photo from the intro or from the lesson and you can compare my face through the whole uh, time of our semester so if you also want to join this please send me also these uh, combinations of your photos <laughs> so that we have um, possibility to show this to the community um, if you want um, also uh, I hope that you are successful in the semester I want to thank you and I want to show you this uh, individual images and here they are the faces of a lecturer doing a lesson in a pandemic situation you see there are not many changes the hair growing and sometimes the hair look less than they are but it was an interesting experience and I was happy that you joined my lesson and then you that you listened my lesson so therefore you should stay safe take care on you and of course I wish you all the best for the exams don't lose your head and always keep smiling okay <laughs> bye bye